Thanks. Uh, statements by members. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My riding of Spadina, Fort York has been fortunate for many years to have the dedicated service of Carolyn Johnson. Carol has recently stepped down as co-chair of the York Key Neighborhood Association after volunteering countless hours to ensure that our community was informed and engaged on the many issues facing our vibrant and diverse urban center. From helping to build a waterfront that's accessible to all, to enhancing community safety and so much more, we owe Carolyn a debt of gratitude for her leadership and unwavering commitment. On behalf of the people of Spadina Fort York, I express my appreciation to Carolyn for her work as YQ&A co-chair and wish her and her husband good health and continued success. I also look forward to continue to work with YQ&A with Angelo, Ula and Mary, whose tireless work keeps residents of our community fully aware of issues that matter the most in our neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Humber River Black Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Mr. Simon Sung for his hard work and contributions to his home country of Taiwan and its relationship with Canada. After starting out in journalism as a young man, Mr. Sung, or just Simon as most of us know him, decided to pursue his Master's in Peace Studies. He went on to join the Foreign Services of Taiwan, serving in Taipei, Singapore, the U.S., and for the past seven and a half years here in Ottawa, serving in the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office. Simon has a great love for his home Taiwan and Canada, and has worked diligently to educate people on the history and culture of this beautiful place, making sure the Canadian MPs are aware of what Taiwan has to offer our country and the world. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, Simon has made sure that the political situation of Taiwan stays top of mind for all of us. Simon, thank you for the great works you have done here in the Ottawa region, and I wish you all the best as you return home. Farewell, Simon. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, in this House I have worked extensively on international human rights issues, but nowadays I see many stories from Canada suggesting that we are a country in need of intervention. One recent story that got my attention was Timothy Q, a 16-year-old who attends Eric Hamber Secondary School in Vancouver. Eric tried to start a Catholic club, a voluntary association of students who get together to discuss Catholic ideas, but administrators forbade him from sharing Catholic teaching at the club, even with students who choose to attend the meetings. This is a shameful violation of freedom of association, but it is one small drop in a growing sea. Religious services have faced pandemic-related restrictions that have not been applied to casinos. Government is proposing criminal charges for people who express certain personal or religious views in private conversations. The Liberal platform promised another ideological values test imposed on charities, and dozens of churches were destroyed or vandalized this summer with virtually no comment from political leaders. If these events were happening in another country, I know that Canada wouldn't be silent. So I hope more members of Parliament resist the populist pressure to clamp down on minority opinions and instead defend freedom of speech, association, and religion as they are protected in our charter. The Honourable Member for Nepean. Mr. Speaker, it is my honour to make this statement today, December 7, 2021, the 100th birth anniversary of His Holiness Pramukh Swami Maharaj. His Holiness was a Hindu Swami of the Swami Narayan Dinmonishan, gifted the people of Canada the magnificent BAPS Swami Narayan Mandir in Toronto, the first traditionally hand-carved Hindu place of worship in Canada. The mandir stands as a symbol of Canada's diversity, cultural mosaic, and spirit of plurality. Today, BPS carries out spiritual and humanitarian activities in 154 towns and cities across our country. Leaving by the motto, in the joy of others lies our own. His Holiness inspired spiritual, humanitarian, environmental, education, health promotion, youth and children's initiatives that touch the people of Canada and the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de, Beau Côte de Beaupré, Ile d'Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my writing, there is 
Cartier Brebeuf National Park, located where Jacques Cartier docked his ship and spent his first winter here and had contact with Chief Donacona and his community. So it's a historically important place, perhaps even an ideal place to introduce kids to the history of Quebec, but it can't be done because the park is closed during the school year. It's only open from June to, to September, and anyone who wants to introduce kids to history in the summer doesn't have much to work with. The posters that dot the park route are barely, alleg are barely legible. Uh, the reproduction of the ship rotted and burned without being replaced. The cross was so badly neglected that it was removed by Parks Canada, and they didn't even bother to replace it. My community is proud to be one of the places where the relationship between Francophones and First Nations began long before the British took the land by force. My community doesn't accept that the government of Canada is trying to erase our history from memory. The Honourable Member for Vimy. Mr. Speaker, the holidays are fast approaching and many families depend on food banks and donations for this year's festivities. I'd encourage all Canadians to open their hearts and give generously. I invite my constituents in Vimy to consider making a donation to our community organizations, whether it's the St. Vincent de Paul Food Drive, the Val Martin Community Center's Toy Exchange, or the Community Children's Health Charity Campaign. There are many ways to help those in need. Dans le besoin, whether it's food, a gift for a child, or money for a local charity, even the smallest donations go a long way in brightening the holidays of those who are struggling. In the words of Winston Churchill, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, February 6, 2022 marks the 70th anniversary of the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen's Platinum Jubilee is a unique, momentous, historic occasion never seen before and will likely never be seen again. In keeping with tradition, Canada should use this anniversary to honour outstanding Canadians with a Platinum Jubilee Medal in recognition of public service, volunteerism and other significant civic contributions. Whether it's for rescuing people threatened during the recent catastrophic flooding, to appreciating frontline service providers during the current pandemic. Rewarding community service with, with a recognition medal is a Canadian tradition. I encourage all Canadians to sign Electronic Petition 3651, initiated by Deep River resident Lucas Bibby on the House of Commons website before December 21st, 2021. Say thank you to our outstanding citizens and honour Queen Elizabeth II on the occasion of her 70th anniversary. Long may she reign. <laughs> served the city of Kirkland longer than John Meany, who sadly left us last month. First elected to City Council in 1975, John served as mayor from 1994 to 2013. All told, he led Kirkland from a town of about 7,500 into a populous and prosperous Montreal suburb of 21,000, doing so with an efficient, decision-making style and practical common-sense approach. John Meany was a proud Irish Montrealer, born in the iconic downtown neighborhood of Griffintown. In 2008, in a fitting honor, he was named Grand Marshal of Montreal's legendary St. Patrick's Parade and in 2012, Montreal's Irishman of the Year. I ask members to join me in offering our sincerest condolences to John's wife, Evelyn, and daughters, Sharon, Colleen, and Laurie. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, en tant que mi As the first woman to represent my community in the House, I've been thinking lately about the importance of having women in politics. We began this week by reflecting on the tragedy of the École Polytechnique massacre. Each year, this moment of mourning and reflection brings back hard memories. The pit I felt in my stomach when I first heard the news that day as a law student surrounded by my female peers. Cet act this cowardly act of misogynist violence failed to stop the progress of women in our professions or academics. We weren't going to let that happen. Of course, we also marked yesterday the 100th anniversary of Agnes MacPhail's election 
as the first female MP in this country. Today we have a record number of female MPs and I expect to join many of them this evening as Equal Voice Canada celebrates 100 years of women parliamentarians at a gala dinner. Let us use our time here to model to our daughters and granddaughters that this is a place where they belong. Leur voix Their voices and contributions count. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Mr. Speaker, it is a great honour to recognize the 100th birth anniversary of His Holiness Pramukh Swami Maharaj. His Holiness was a Hindu Swami of Swami Narayan denomination and he gifted the people of Canada the magnificent Baps Swami Narayan Mandir in Toronto, which is the first traditionally hand-carved Hindu place of worship in all of Canada. The Mandir stands as a symbol of Canada's abundant diversity, cultural mosaic, and freedom of religion. His Holiness lived in the, by the saying, in the joy of others lies our own. This was evident in his work, which promoted health and inspired spiritual, humanitarian, environmental, and educational initiatives. Mr. Speaker, BAPS charities have supported communities right across Canada, including in my riding of Edmonton Mill Woods, and provided thousands of COVID vaccines to Canadians. Since his passing in 2016, his successor, His Holiness Mahant Swami Maharaj, continues his legacy of inspiring people around the world. Pramukh Swami Maharaj's life work is one that needs to be preserved and celebrated for the present and future generations. Before continuing, I just want to call order for a moment. We have, we have members making statements, and we'd like to hear everything they say. It's, it's nice to hear everyone talking amongst themselves, but the murmur is getting to a point where it's more than that, and it's making it difficult for us to hear what the Honourable Members... And while I'm up, I want to remind all the members that SO31s are 60 seconds long. Some of them have gone a little bit longer than that. I don't want to have to cut anybody off. The Honourable Member for Fleetwood, Port Kells. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to register deep concern over the performance of some local radio outlets during the storms and floodings in British Columbia. On one forum, a former broadcaster commented, after watching Abbotsford Mayor Braun's press conference on the city's YouTube channel warning residents of Sumas Prairie to evacuate now, I dialed up the city's radio station to hear what they were doing. After painfully struggling through a five-minute commercial cluster, they played their station ID and went back to another ten songs in a row. A disaster can wipe out landlines, cell phones, cable and the internet, but traditionally, news and alerts have always been as close as that car or truck radio. I plan to ask the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage to review broadcasters' performance in BC, including disaster plans, staff resources and technical resiliency. With station ownership now so much in the hands of large corporations, there's no excuse for Canadians to be underserved. The Honourable, Honourable, de... the Honourable Member for montmagny lillet Kamouraska rivière de loup Mr. Speaker, Christmas is the time to open our hearts and give generously to those in need. Food banks support people of all ages in my riding through various services. Over the past year, they have faced unprecedented demand. Many food banks in the area have reported an increase of over 50% in the number of people coming to them for help, not to mention supply problems. In this holiday season, I'd encourage all members of our community to join me in contributing with food or cash donations to support families. There are many local and regional charity drives, associations, shelters and grocery stores working together in my riding. We can also count on volunteers from the following organizations. Moisson Kamouraska, Carrefour d'Initiative Populaire, Soupe au Bouton and La Maison de Secours La Frontière. Once again, I invite all people to be generous so everyone can have a wonderful Christmas. Happy holidays to all.
The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker, tonight, with equal voice, we're celebrating 100 years of women in the House and the 374 female members of Parliament elected since then. Uh -huh. Over this century, there have been many firsts, beginning with Agnes McPhail breaking the glass ceiling when she was the first woman elected to the House of Commons, along with the first female Cabinet Minister, Ellen Fairclough, and our first female Prime Minister, Kim Campbell. I have the honour of being the first female engineer in the House of Commons. I want to thank these trailblazing women for their hard work and their dedication in paving the way for us now. And I want to honour their legacy by having uh, more diverse voices from women, marginalised communities and minorities here in the House. This will better reflect the diversity of Canada and create a strong political foundation for the representation of all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, let us celebrate 100 years of women in this House and look forward to a future of even more. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud to stand up in the House today to highlight some of the remarkable work being done at McMaster University. I'm a proud Mac grad and marauder, so the opportunity to speak to their work to develop Canada's global nexus for pandemics and biological threats is especially significant. Avec des experts mondiaux en mal with world-renowned experts in infectious disease, McMaster mobilized against COVID-19. Work of experts from academia, industry, and government working to prevent and prepare for the next pandemic. Researchers at Canada's Global Nexus have developed a second-generation inhalable vaccine, which is expected to be highly effective against emerging variants. I read this morning that researchers at Mac are starting, to, starting their phase one trials of the inhaled COVID vaccine now. Canadian research excellence is leading Canada's contribution to the global recovery from this pandemic so that every country can emerge stronger and more resilient than ever. Je veux remercier tout le monde. I'd like to thank everyone at MAC for their hard work and their innovation, which saved lives. Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. We are seeing the impacts of climate change in Canada. From the recent floods and mudslides in British Columbia, to the storms that have threatened Atlantic Canada, to the wildfires, floods and droughts that have wrecked havoc in Alberta. But Albertans are actually facing two crises. One is the climate crisis and one is the economic crisis. Albertans are caught between the need to reduce emissions and our reliance on the oil and gas sector. 140,000 Albertans work directly in the sector and hundreds of thousands more jobs rely upon it. If we don't support workers in Alberta, Canada will not be able to meet our climate obligations. Yeah. After decades of contributing to building Canada's economy, it is time for federal leadership to help Alberta secure a lower carbon future. We need targeted investment to reduce emissions within the sector and targeted investments to create jobs outside the sector. Alberta has the knowledge base and we just need the federal government to invest in Albertans. This cannot wait. This government must invest in a federal jobs plan now. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lawrence schooners, those traditional wooden boats, were for a long time the only means of transportation allowing the development and the supply of cities and coastal villages along the St. Lawrence. And this was well before railways and roads. As the daughter and granddaughter of a schooner captain, I know about the courage, the love of the river, and the science of these sailors on these precious little boats built by hand by them. I want to testify here to the importance of preserving these boats, bearers of memory, history, and pride. The renowned Charlevoix Maritime, Maritime Museum is fighting hard to implement an important project to conserve the, these boats. The government of Quebec has just confirmed an amount of $5 million for this purpose. As a daughter of the river, I would be remiss if I didn't call upon the Minister of Canadian Heritage to follow suit and confirm the $700,000 in assistance requested by the museum to finalize the financial package that will allow these boats, the jewels of the St. Lawrence, to remain ship shape. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Thank you.
pay tribute to the people in my riding of Chilliwack Hope for their selfless and heroic actions during the BC storm last month. Farmers rushed into rising floodwaters with their trucks and trailers to help their fellow farmers rescue thousands of animals in the Sumas Prairie. Hundreds of people sandbag in the middle of the night to prevent a catastrophic failure of the Barrowtown pump station. The people of Hope cared for 1,200 stranded travellers who were cut off for days due to landslides and road closures. Faith communities, service clubs and neighbours sprang into action to help however they could. Angling guides used their own boats to deliver food, take people to medical appointments and help with the recovery effort. First responders and road crews worked around the clock to rebuild supply lines and keep us safe. I've never been more proud of my community. We came together in a spirit of unity to do whatever needed to be done. We were there for one another during the crisis, and I know we'll continue to be there for one another as we rebuild together. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Mr. Speaker, I rise to honour a friend and former Liberal MP, Bob Next. Kilger, <laughs> whose Thanks. battle with cancer came to an end last week. I never got the chance to serve with Bob, but I got to know him through my dear friend and his wife, Courtney. Bob was so generous with me, with his time, not only giving me advice, but he mentored my staff. Bob told me early on to never be on the bad side of the whip, <laughs> and the people working in the WHIP's office are extraordinary. They have seen it all, so take their advice and guidance. They won't steer you wrong. My favorite story about Bob is the time Wayne Easter and another Liberal MP were not in agreement on an issue, and there was a contentious committee meeting coming up with the two of them. So Bob, as WHIP and a former NHL ref, sat, went to that committee meeting, sat right in between the two, and made sure nothing happened <laughs> and that they all stayed in line. And as someone who served with Wayne a lot on committee, I know how difficult it is to keep him in line. <laughs> I will miss my chats with Bob, but I won't forget his lessons. And I will. I want to thank Bob's wife, Courtney, his entire family, for sharing Bob with us, because this place is better because Bob served here. Oh, Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Two years. That's how much time the government had to prepare for the evacuation of Canadian citizens, interpreters and contractors in Afghanistan. A 2019 CSIS report said there would be a quick collapse in Afghanistan if the U.S. withdrew. With over two years to prepare, how did this Prime Minister oversee the biggest foreign policy disaster in decades? Oh. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've continued to be there for the people of Afghanistan, even after having withdrawn uh, our troops over 10 years ago. Uh, that's why we continue to work uh, with our partners and allies on the evacuation of, uh, of people from Afghanistan through, this, uh, through the summer. Uh, and indeed, uh, we continue to stand by our commitment to uh, repatriate 40,000 uh, Afghans to their new home in Canada uh, over the coming times. Uh, this is the work we're continuing to do because Canadians expect it. We continue to work alongside our allies around the world to do just that. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, at the end of August, when evacuation operations ended in Afghanistan, 1,250 Canadians remained in that country. 1,215 Canadians stranded on the ground as a terrorist group seized control of the country. And what was this Prime Minister doing at the time, Mr. Speaker? Campaigning. The longest war in Canadian history ended with Canadians, Afghan interpreters and contractors being completely abandoned by this Prime Minister. Canadians want to know why. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Murray, Mr. Speaker, throughout the month of August, officials, ministers, uh, extraordinary members of the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, diplomats were engaged in a historic effort uh, to get uh, as many Afghans out of the country, get as many Canadians home as possible. We worked alongside our partners around the world. Uh, we were there uh, to support as many as possible, and we continue uh, to stand strongly with our allies on pressuring the Taliban to allow people uh, to leave the country so we can welcome them here in Canada to start their new lives. Sure. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Historic efforts, Mr. Speaker. You know what this Prime Minister was doing as Afghanistan fell? He was preparing for an election, Shameful. calling an election as Kabul fell, planning an election instead of an evacuation, Mr. Speaker. Shameful. My simple question for the Prime Minister is this. On August 15th, when he was briefed on Kabul about to fall, why did this Prime Minister put his own political survival ahead of the real survival of people on the ground in Afghanistan? The right honourable Prime Minister. Remember the speed at which events unfolded in Afghanistan and the intensity with which members of the Canadian Armed Forces, our diplomats, our partners around the world continued to step up uh, to evacuate uh, people from Afghanistan to make sure Canadians were getting out to safety and indeed to continue to be engaged uh, with the people of Afghanistan throughout. Uh, we know that there continues to need to be pressure on the Taliban government to allow people to leave Afghanistan. That is what we're continuing to do alongside our partners, and we will uh, bring 40,000 Afghan citizens to Canada to start their new lives. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. The President. Mr. Speaker, two years to reflect and slowness. Two years of failure, and it continues despite SOSs, uh, the evacuation of Canadians, interpreters, and Afghan allied entrepreneurs was not a priority for this Liberal government. Why? Did this government ignore the calls of Canadians and create the biggest diplomatic disaster in decades? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our soldiers, our diplomats, people who worked tirelessly to evacuate thousands of people from Afghanistan and who continue to work to ensure that 40,000 Afghans can come to settle in Canada in the future. We will continue to put pressure on the Taliban to ensure that people can get out safely. We will continue to work with the international community to ensure that we can give a better life to tens of thousands of people who deserve it. The Leader of the Opposition. Sans Tirelessly, he called an election, Mr. Speaker. Foreign policy from this Liberal government is a disaster. That's clear. Failure after failure. There are 1,250 Canadians stranded in Afghanistan. Taliban are terrorizing people. And instead, there was a needless election. Why? Did the government fail our Afghan allies? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that's simply false. We worked with our allies on Afghanistan, with organizations, with our international partners, the members of our Canadian forces, our diplomats, our public servants, all worked tirelessly to help the most number the highest number of people possible in August and we continue to work with the international community to put pressure on the Taliban in order to ensure that people can leave and people can come to Canada we will take in 40,000 Mr. Speaker in order to ensure that we can continue to be there for the people of Afghanistan the honorable member for Belo et Chambly Mr. Speaker I am discovering that the liberals are discovering the virtues of being here in the house it's a real pleasure However, I am concerned, and I want to tell everybody that I am concerned, because according to Radio Canada, Ottawa is preparing to amend a very important regulation, which would ban the uh, putting oil sands tailings pond water directly into the Athabasca River. These, there's metal and other chemical, dangerous, harmful toxins in this water. And according to current regulations, this isn't allowed. Can the Prime Minister tell us that this is false? and that he will not allow water to be, these tailing ponds water to be 
put directly into the river. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we know that there is no healthy economy without a healthy environment. We are working with Indigenous leaders and the provinces, with industry and stakeholders to develop strict standards on the quality of water in tailing ponds in order to publish regulations in 2024. This important work will help us to reduce the risks for the environment and the health related to the storing of toxic metals. The Honourable Member for Belo Chambly, clear measures. I can propose to him clear measures like the ban that's currently in place. The Minister of the Environment must have difficult days the these days because not only is the government funding the oil and gas industry setting false uh, targets and abolishing regulations, but every time there is so much being added that the government is so much in the pockets of the uh, oil and gas that the Conservatives will have an identity problem. I would ask the Prime Minister to uphold the ban of putting tailing ponds waters into the Athabasca River, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, currently there is a ban that does exist. We are setting out standards that will come into uh, effect in 2024 in order to create strict standards on water quality, water from the oil sands. These are measures supported by scientific facts. These measures will protect our environment, Mr. Speaker. Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The fiscal update presents an opportunity for this Liberal government to tackle inflation, which is driving up the cost of living for families. Families are feeling squeezed, and they're struggling to make ends meet. The Liberals say there's nothing they can do. We disagree. They can immediately help people find a home that's in their budget. They can also put a limit on the charges that cell phone and inner companies charge Canadians, which are amongst the highest in the world. So will the Prime Minister commit today to use the economic update as an opportunity to tackle the rising cost of living? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite said, next week we will be releasing our economic and fiscal update. Yeah. We will provide Canadians with a transparent look at our public finances and our plan to finish the fight against COVID-19, make life more affordable for Canadians, and ensure our economic recovery leaves no one behind. The best way to get our economy growing and to support Canadians is uh, by ending COVID-19. Uh, we're going to continue to move forward as we have on I initiatives from uh, increasing the Canada Child Benefit to match the cost of living, $10 a day childcare for families, boost to GIS for vulnerable seniors, more support for stu students, uh, and many other things that we continue to do to support affordability for families. Well, member for Burnaby South. The economic update is an opportunity for the Liberal government. It can resolve the issue of inflation, which is increasing the cost of living. It is increasingly difficult for families to make ends meet. The Liberals are saying that they can't do anything. We don't agree. The Liberal government can help families to find affordable housing. It can also put limits on internet and cell phone prices. Will the Prime Minister commit to making life more affordable in the economic update, yes or no? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, inflation caused by the pandemic is being felt around the world and Canadians are seeing an increase in prices. As we have said throughout the pandemic, we will continue to be there for Canadians. The economic and fiscal update 2021 will give Canadians a transparent look at our public finances as well as a plan to put an end to COVID-19, make life more affordable for Canadians and ensure that our economic recovery leaves no one behind. The best way to increase our economy and make life more affordable is to put an end to COVID-19 and that is exactly what we are doing. Member for South Surrey, White Rocks. Mr. Speaker, today we put forward a motion for a special all-party House of Commons committee to examine Canada's flawed evacuation from Afghanistan. Instead of saving lives, we got an election. Some 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members served in Afghanistan and worked closely with Afghan interpreters that we promised to protect and evacuate from the country. Now they hide in safe houses to avoid Taliban death squads. 
Will the government support this motion to examine what went so wrong on this government's watch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, the question of Afghanistan is important. It is important for our government. It is important for all Canadians. I just came back from NATO and USE, where I had the, the chance to meet with many of my counterparts and with, where we looked into the lesson learned regarding what happened in Afghanistan. We can be extremely proud of being one of the countries that will be resettling one of the most uh, Afghan refugees in the world. 40,000 is our commitment, and we will get there. And of course, Mr. Speaker, we can be proud also because we'll be resettling many of the NATO-linked refugees and flights are arriving as we speak. Thank you. I, I just want to remind the honourable members that the way it works in the chamber is you ask the question and you get a, a response. Uh, if, you, if you ask questions while the person is answering, it just messes things up and makes things difficult. The honourable member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, I would love it if we got a response. What I'm hearing yeah. is delays and platitudes and excuses. We're it's solid. just not good enough. No. We had 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members put their lives in the hands of our allies and our interpreters in Afghanistan. They served together bravely and selflessly so that we could try and build a new Afghanistan. We promised our allies and their families protection and a new life. And this government broke that solemn bond. Just talking about 40,000 without doing it means nothing. Absolutely. Canadians returned here to safe... The Honourable Minister of Foreign what are you Affairs. <laughs> or, sorry, the Honourable Minister of Immigration. I thank the Honourable Member for her question. I think all members of this House will agree of the importance of Canada making good on its commitment to resettle 40,000 Afghan refugees. The op side opposite is asking when people are going to arrive. Two weeks ago when I was asked this question, Mr. Speaker, I said that 3,800 were here. Earlier this week when I was asked the question, we had more than 4,000. I'm pleased to share by the end of this week, 500 more Afghan refugees will be arriving, including for the first time privately sponsored refugees from Afghanistan in my home province of Nova Scotia. Our commitment will not waver, and we will make good on bringing 40,000 vulnerable Afghan refugees to Canada. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, this summer, Canada failed to do its job when it came time to help our Afghan allies. Uh, we all have these memories uh, of the dramatic images of Afghan citizens uh, hanging on to planes taking off. It was terrible what happened in Afghanistan. These people are our friends, our allies. Uh, they helped Canadian soldiers when we were in Afghanistan. We're talking about interpreters, support staff, their families. Canadians need to know why we haven't been able to help them properly. If the Prime Minister can the Prime Minister not support our request for a special committee to look at the question? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. In fact, Afghan is an important question, and of course, Canada served alongside a number of allies, NATO allies in Afghanistan, and we were supported by a number of people, Afghan people, there on the ground. That is why we decided to honour our commitment to Afghanistan, Afghans, by having 40,000 refugees come to Canada. We are almost uh, at 5,000. We are taking in the most re Afghan refugees. The situation in Afghanistan is currently very difficult. We will continue to work with our partners in order to ensure the safety and security and the return of these refugees home here. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, during this debate, keeping in mind the fact that these people, our friends, our allies, put their lives in danger to ensure that we could do our jobs. We shouldn't be playing petty politics, but the reality is what? It's very sad to see the minister laugh because uh, starting in 2016, the leader of the opposition told the House that we needed a plan to bring people back. And when we needed Canada to do everything it could to bring these people in, the Prime Minister called a partisan, egotistical election. If the government has nothing to reproach itself, will it do what the opposition is asking? The Honourable Minister. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have no lessons to learn from my colleague uh, when it comes to partisan politics because that's exactly what the Conservatives are doing right now. That said, dear colleagues, of course, we will do 
what is necessary to learn the lessons from Afghanistan. Of course, we as the government, we are prepared to work, of course, with the opposition, but also other countries must do so, and we are also doing that through NATO. Something else that's very important, we have to be there for Afghans who want to come to Canada. They helped Canadians. We must do that while respecting the nation Canada's national security, and that's what we will do. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Those who served alongside Canadians in Afghanistan deserve better than being left unread by this government. The Prime Minister avoided accountability and abandoned those who served Canada by calling a selfish election. Veterans, Canadians, and Afghan interpreters want to know why the Liberal government failed them so bad. Will the Minister commit to voting in favour of today's opposition motion so Afghan interpreters and support staff know why they were abandoned and make sure this failure never happens again. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Speaker, of course we want to learn what happened in Afghanistan. We want also to make sure that the future of Afghanistan is better than it is right now. And that's why we're really continuing to follow the situation in Afghanistan very closely. We are very, very preoccupied with the situation of Afghan, particularly women and girls, right now in Afghanistan. That's why I've raised the issue with all my counterparts. That's why this is an absolute priority. And that's why we will play our part as a country to bring back 40,000 Afghan refugees to our country. Bravo. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary for Islam. It's a priority that an election needed to be called. The Minister loves to say that 4,000 Afghan refugees have, to come to, have come to Canada. Only a Liberal would pat themselves on the back for meeting only 10% of their promises without any timeline or plan to complete the rest. It seems like only privately sponsored Afghan refugees have been arriving recently. Veterans, charities and NGOs have been picking up the massive slack left by this government. On what date will the remaining 90% of Afghan refugees be brought to Canada? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, and if he wants to frame this in terms of the recent election campaign, I would point out that on this side of the House, we campaigned on a commitment to bring 40,000 Afghan refugees. On the opposition side, they campaigned on a commitment to end the government-assisted refugee stream. He criticizes our... I just want to make sure. Can we can we proceed? Okay, uh, the honourable minister for immigration. I missed his answer. Can he start from the top, please? Mr. Speaker, the truth hurts sometimes, but the reality is if the members of the opposition would like to frame this in the context of the recent federal election campaign, I would point out that the government campaigned on a commitment to bring 40,000 Afghan refugees to Canada. The Conservative Party of Canada campaigned on a commitment to end the government-assisted refugee stream altogether, Mr. Speaker. And if he's concerned about the timeline for new arrivals, we anticipate that on two charter flights tomorrow, an additional 520 Afghan refugees will land in Canada, and that's something we should all be proud of. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métisse, Matan, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, yet another shooting yesterday, this time in a library, inside a library in Laval. An 18-year-old was shot it's inside a library. Or now we're talking about guns being fired inside libraries. Now that this line has been crossed, now that the use of guns is so commonplace that people are shooting inside public spaces, the future seems bleak. What is the minister doing today to reassure concerned families? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for her question. Our thoughts go to all the victims caused by gun violence and all weapons, in fact. $46 million are being given to Quebec to put in place prevention strategies, gun-related and gang prevention strategies. I am talking with my provincial colleague later, and I will continue to work and in close collaboration with all our partners, even the MPs in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Matisse, Matan, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, if we're at the point where shots are being fired in a library, what will happen next? Uh, 
the situation is getting worse almost daily in Greater Montreal, and the government doesn't seem to find it urgent to take action. No one today feels reassured by what the federal government has done in the past to fight gun trafficking because it's not enough. What we want to hear is the minister send a clear message and take concrete action so that we can say, well, finally, the federal government has done its job. What will the minister do? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I share the concerns of my colleague. That is why our government has already taken many concrete actions, for example, through introducing a ban on assault-style weapons, introducing more resources or providing more resources to the border to stop the gun trafficking and fight against gun violence, uh, as well as with working in close collaboration with uh, other levels of government to create safe spaces for everyone. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métisse, Matan, Matipédia. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about a gun culture. Gangs buy, sell, and use gums, le guns like they were toys. They're, in fact, as easy to get as toys. The minister has some possible solutions first. He can look to his own party. He spent the election campaign saying that the RCMP was underfunded and that prison sentences are not harsh enough. He can listen to his employees. Border services themselves have said that they are underused. He can also listen to the Bloc Québécois suggestions. We have continued to make many. The uh, past two weeks, the minister has been telling us the same thing. When will he take action? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. Our government is always prepared to work with the bloc and with all the parties in the House in order to find and identify concrete solutions to fight against gun-related crime. We will continue to do this, to work with the Quebec government to stop gun trafficking at borders and also engage in various forums with the U.S. It's a major challenge, a major issue, but our government has a commitment to address this issue. Member for Carlton. In order to supply themselves with cheap cash for their record deficits, the government had the central bank flood lending markets with $400 billion of cash. We now learn that $192 billion of that overflowed into mortgage markets, and a quarter of all mortgages outstanding today are low quality and variable rates sub highly uh, subjected to increases in interest rates. That has inflated housing prices by a third and created the second biggest housing bubble in the world. Will the finance minister admit that Canada has a housing bubble? Well, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, the Conservatives continue to irresponsibly scaremonger and try to talk down the Canadian economy. But the fact is, our Q3 GDP was 5.4 per cent, beating market expectations and surpassing the US, Japan, the UK, and Australia. We have now recovered 106 per cent of the jobs lost to the COVID recession, compared to just 83 per cent in the US. And you know what? In the fall, Moody's and S&P reaffirmed our AAA credit rating. The Honourable Member for Carleton. It's always reassuring to have your credit rating backed up by those who said subprime mortgages were rock solid in late uh, 2008. But the question was about Canada's housing exactly. bubble. Exactly. I have asked this minister eight times now in the House of Commons if we have a housing bubble. Raj wants to know. He's driving Uber in addition to having an IT job in order to save up over the next 15 years wow. in order to make a down payment on a $1 million Brampton home. Canadians deserve to know. Bloomberg has said Canada has the second most inflated housing bubble on planet Earth. So yes or no, will the minister admit, does Canada have a housing bubble? The Honourable Minister, minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is it's, it's been a long time since the member opposite has spoken about affordable housing. He's found it fashionable to talk about it. But here's the record. They've, every time that we've put forward measures in place to help first-time home buyers access affordable housing, help the most vulnerable in our community access permanent housing solutions, help women and children fleeing domestic violence to get rental support, 
He has voted against those measures, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for levy lotte Mr. Speaker, when it comes to labor shortages in Quebec, the manufacturing sector in the greater region of chaudière appalaches is currently losing $7 million a day in production contracts due to a shortage of workers. They need temporary foreign workers in order to meet demand now. Will the government present a plan to simplify the temporary foreign worker approval process? Mr. Speaker, we are talking with the government of Quebec about temporary foreign workers. This is more simple. The government of Quebec is able now to bring in more workers more quickly. Some of the measures came into place yesterday. The rest will come in in the weeks to come. But I can assure the member and everyone in this House, we're working very closely with the government of Quebec on temporary foreign workers. The Honourable Member for La Ville Aubinière. Mr. Speaker, we need a plan as quick as possible, nothing less, to save there's a point of order. We don't have, we don't hear the interpretation. We're going to wait a few seconds. I'm going to speak in English just to see if it's, is it being, tra no, we're not getting any translation. Okay, la, tra la traduction. The, the Honourable Member for Livy Lobignard, please start your question again. Mr. Speaker, we need a plan as quick as possible, nothing less, to save the manufacturing sector in Quebec. The government must make the labor shortage a priority issue before our companies move elsewhere in the world because of the lack of leadership from this government. Mr. Speaker, the government must review the entire temporary foreign worker process to provide more flexibility, speed, and consistency for the well-being of the Canadian economy. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives continue to denigrate Canada's solid economic recovery after the COVID recession. This may be because we did a much better job than that they did in 2008 when they were in power. Canada has already more than recovered all the jobs that were lost during the COVID recession. However, after the 2008 recession, it took almost eight months more for employment to be reestablished. Member for London Fanshawe. Emmanuel Benjamin is a 71-year-old senior from my riding whose GIS benefit was suddenly reduced because he accessed pandemic supports last year. Emmanuel was already living below the poverty line and his income has now been reduced from $1,500 to $600 a month. He can't afford rent, food or medication. He may lose everything if this government doesn't step up and fix the issue immediately. The Liberal government has admitted there's a problem. So when will they fix this and do what's right for Canadian seniors? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Seniors. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of the pandemic, we told Canadians and seniors that we would be there for them as long as they needed. And that is exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We have always prioritized the most vulnerable seniors by strengthening their GIS. We provided immediate and direct financial support to seniors this summer. And when it comes to Serb GIS, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the Honourable Member that we're working on the issue to find the best solution. Mr. Speaker, we will be there for seniors. The Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, Mr. Speaker, raising the GIS just to claw it back again isn't going to do anything for people like Emmanuel. And that answer isn't going to pay his rent. So we've been asking this question for some time now. We see a government that's clawed back the GIS, the Canada Child Benefit, They've cut the CRB for 900,000 Canadians, just as we're seeing COVID case counts go up and financial support isn't there for all of those 900,000 people who need it, Mr. Speaker. So when is it that the government's going to stop building the recovery on the backs of the financially vulnerable and actually look for some of the money at the top, like the, like the publicly traded companies that took the wage subsidy and haven't paid anything back except to their shareholders? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Employment. 
Mr. Speaker, I can assure everyone in this House that we have been unwavering and continue to support workers throughout this pandemic. That's why C2 talks about um, continuing the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit, the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit. That's why we're creating the lockdown benefit. That's why we're continuing with support for businesses to hire workers and to provide rental support. There's a lot we're doing for workers and businesses, Mr. Speaker. And as the Deputy Prime Minister said, we've regained 106 percent of the jobs we lost during the pandemic. Our unemployment was down last month, again, for the sixth month in a row. We're within 0.4 percent of a record high in February of 2020. The Honourable Member for Yukon. Mr. Speaker, last week we were shocked to learn that the Yukon's rate of opioid fatalities is Canada's highest. While this toxic drug crisis has been addressed with many interventions in recent years, we are painfully aware that there is still much to do. Safe supply, supervised consumption, better access to treatment, effective prevention and decriminalization are all approaches that can help prevent more deaths. Can the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions update the House about how the federal government is working in partnership with the Yukon to stop this ongoing tragedy? The Honourable Minister for Mental Health. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for his question and for his extensive work on this issue as Minister, Min, Medical Officer of Health for the Yukon and for joining me last week uh, for the discussions with Yukon ministers and the First Nations leadership. Our hearts are with the families, loved ones and communities of those we have lost to the overdose and toxic drug supply crisis. Our government is working in partnership with provinces, territories, municipalities, Indigenous communities, experts and those with lived and living experience to consider all proposals to implement innovative bottom-up solutions to this crisis. The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, as an MP with four border crossings in my riding, I can tell you the Rive Can app has been a real mess. Take the example of Bernadette in my riding. She was forced into a 14-day quarantine when she is double vaccinated, has a booster, and is now receiving threatening phone calls harassing her to complete her testing requirements or face a jail time and or a $650,000 fine. She's 75 years old. When will this Liberal government fix the mess they created at the borders and rescind this unnecessary quarantine order against my constituents? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Speaker, I want to assure all members that we are going to never hesitate on this side of the House to introduce the public health care measures that are necessary to protect the health and safety of all Canadians, especially now that we are dealing with a new variant of concern in the Omicron. The Arrive Can app is a useful and essential tool in understanding. I'm going to have to interrupt the Honourable Minister. I, I'm trying to listen, but I, I have yelling into my left ear that makes it very hard. The Honourable Minister, if I can get him to start from the top so I can hear the whole answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, um, this government will never hesitate to introduce the public health care measures that are necessary at the border, and the Arrive Can app is one of the tools in the kit that we are using to ensure that we are screening returning uh, Canadians uh, for those who are vaccinated. Uh, it has been a mandatory requirement since the beginning, and we will continue to communicate, as well as introducing flexibility at the border where we can. But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we have to ensure that we are doing everything that we can to protect protect against this new variant of concern in Omicron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, uh, Okanagan Similkami Nicola. Mr. Speaker, this government just is not listening. Now, one of my constituents, Alan, crossed the border with his wife to attend a matter in Washington State and returned an hour later. Now, despite the government announcing a 72-hour exemption and being fully vaccinated because Alan doesn't use a smartphone, he and his wife were told their documents weren't accepted and they would have to quarantine and send in virtual tests or face a $5,000 fine. Will the government quit discriminating against people like my constituents for not having a smartphone and immediately rescind this unfair quarantine order? The Honourable Minister. Mr. 
Speaker, as my colleague just acknowledged, this government has already introduced flexibility at the border to ensure that we are facilitating the arrival of those Canadians, including the 72-hour exemption rule, particularly for those Canadians who are going back and forth across the border and who need essential goods. But we will not compromise when it comes to health and safety, Mr. Speaker, and that's the reason why we are requiring those returning from the United States to be fully vaccinated. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we use the Arrive Can app to ensure the health and safety of all Canadians, particularly now as we're dealing with a new variant of concern in Omicron. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. The horror show of Liberal quarantine hotels has returned, Mr. Speaker. Five-hour waits in crowded airports, bus to hotels at secret locations, served food described as cold gruel. A Ciliac Edmonton woman went 40 hours without food that she could eat safely. Babies are going without milk and diapers. Some don't have hot water or heat in their hotel rooms. It's almost like jail, but at least in jail you get hot meals, fresh air and care packages from home, Mr. Speaker. This isn't Canada, one man told us yesterday. He's right. Where is the respect and dignity Canadians deserve? Shame on this Canadian government is what we've heard repeatedly from Canadians. When will the Liberals end this inhumane treatment? For once, treat Canadians with dignity and respect, here, Mr. Here. The Honourable Minister of Transport. We made a commitment to Canadians to do everything we can to protect their health and safety. We are also protecting our economy, Mr. Speaker. Canadians over the last year and a half have sacrificed a lot. We need to be vigilant at the border to ensure that we mitigate the arrival of Omicron. However, Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the Conservatives. Last week, they're saying we need more measures. Today, they're saying we need less measures. I'm not really sure what it is that they're asking for. We will follow the advice we received from public health experts, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Mr. Speaker. Monsieur. Yeah. It's not just at airports where things are messed up. The Liberal ministers have lost control. The Health Minister says measures will take a few days to put in place. The Minister of Transport says that these me measures still can change. The Public Safety Minister is doing nothing. The airport... The conditions at quarantine hotels are horrible. Do you know who's telling the truth? Paul Arcan, who says these programs are all messed up. When will the ministers act together in favour of Canadians and not against them? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for giving us the opportunity to talk about this issue. It's important with the new Omicron variant to protect the health and safety of people. And these measures do take a little while to set up. And I'd like to thank all our partners, including those who are at airports for and all the exports who are telling that we have telling us that we have to be vigilant and cautious right now and that's what we're hearing from all our exports experts and that is what we're doing for, out of a sake of caution last week we thought that Ottawa was being proactive at the border but today we realize it's just getting sloppier faster the government has decided to impose covid tests on incoming tr air travelers while acknowledging that some airports are unable to offer these tests. People are confused, and they fear that they'll have to quarantine themselves somewhere while waiting for a courier to pick up their test. The result is we no longer know who has to quarantine and for how long. What is the government waiting for to put, this, to put some order in this worrisome mess? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to remind my colleague. Well, to congratulate him for his uh, re-election and his emphasis on the health and safety of Canadians in the current situation for Canadians, which is very worrisome. We're doing things quickly, we're setting things up, and people know that the people who are in charge have been changed, but we're going to continue work, work together. And COVID-19 isn't over, and we have to continue to follow the evolution of this variant and this virus seriously in the coming weeks and months. The Honourable Member from Hong Kong. Mr. Speaker, the confusion surrounding screening tests in airports is kind of like the A38 permit scene in the 12 Tasks of Asterix movie. Quebec families who have experienced this mess at airports will surely think of the minister when they watch the Cine Cado Christmas show. What will this government do to stop the chaotic management of COVID testing from becoming the house that drives you mad in asterisks. The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, the uh, mention to the upcoming holiday period is a good one because in the coming weeks, things will change. There will be more contact within airports and I think and elsewhere. And I think Canadians have to follow public health guidelines. And I think people have made the right choices up to now and they'll continue to do so with the upcoming holidays. Thank you. Hampton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, constituents in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and many rural Canadians are unable to access fibre internet because large ISPs will lay down the backbone but fail to finish the last important mile. Although the Universal Broadband Fund supports the last mile, many of the ISPs are not taking advantage of this and are simply leaving Canadians not connected. Mr. Speaker, what will this government do to ensure that all rural Canadians receive last mile connections? Awesome. The Honourable uh, Minister. I appreciate the question from my colleague across the way. Since 2015, we've approved programs and projects that are going to connect 1.7 million Canadian households, and by 2026, we're going to connect another 1.2 million Canadian families with better, faster internet. By then, 98% of Canada will be connected. Connecting every household, Mr. Speaker, every business, every community, that's how we're going to build back better. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brantford, Brent. Mr. Speaker, the cost of living has been dramatically increasing since the Liberals formed government in 2015. It's much more challenging now to keep up with the rising prices on literally everything, but especially the essential items. Jennifer, a single mother from my riding, told me that she cannot afford the basic needs for her kids. She often finds herself having to choose between buying clothing or putting food on the table. This is not just inflation. When is this Liberal government going to stop printing money to cover up their economic mismanagement? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me share some more good economic news which the Conservatives seem determined to talk down the Canadian economy. But you know, the OECD in their economic outlook for December noted that not only do they expect our recovery to be the second fastest in the G7, but our net debt to GDP ratio is expected to decline and remain the lowest in the G7. Canada is recovering and Canadians should be proud of you. Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Mr. Speaker, labour shortages in the Columbia Valley are tied directly to issues with the temporary foreign worker program and the lack of affordable housing. Our economic recovery in Kootenay, Columbia depends on the government doing more than talking when it comes to fixing these issues for tourism hospitality operators like Pavi Kunkun in Golden British Columbia. Mr. Speaker, when Will the government stop talking and start fixing the problems that make it impossible for the tourism hospitality sector to succeed? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you one thing that all members of this House, including the members opposite, could do this week for the tourism and hospitality sector, and that is to help us pass Bill C-2. This is legislation which is there to help precisely those tourism businesses. We understand that Omicron is still here. We understand those businesses need support. But what I don't understand is why do Conservatives, who allegedly care so much about these vital small businesses, not want to actually help them? Here, here. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian pandemic has affected Canadians, our industries, and also our small businesses and community organizations. Our government has supported them by quickly imp implementing measures, including CERB and the wage subsidy. And also, we helped create a targeted program for the black community, which is greatly appreciated in my writing of Bourassa. Can the Minister of International Trade give us more detail about this program that helps black business owners and entrepreneurs? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague and congratulate him for his re-election. The success of black entrepreneurs 
and business owners is a priority for our government, and they make a significant contribution to our economy every day. Through the Black Entrepreneur Program Ecosystem Fund, $10.7 million has already been distributed to support black entrepreneurs in Montreal and those in Bourassa, for example. We will continue, uh, well, rather, I'm looking forward to sharing more news about other projects that are successful in the near future. For Edmonton, with Taskowin. Mr. Speaker, 361 days ago, this House came together to vote unanimously on a motion put forward by the member from Caribou, Prince George, to take immediate action to establish a nationwide three-digit 988 suicide prevention hotline. In a world where we can hold a $600 million election in the midst of a global pandemic, surely we can activate a three-digit telephone number that nobody's using and work with dedicated stakeholders on an initiative everyone agrees is a priority. This is important, and it should be easy. Why is it taking so long? Mr. Speaker, our government supports a national three-digit hotline for Canadians in crisis, and I thank the member for Caribou, Prince George, for his tireless advocacy on this issue. The CRTC is currently considering public input from consultations that concluded on September 1st. We believe that such a line should have the capacity to connect people in the most appropriate support in the most appropriate way. Our government remains committed to fully funding a national three-digit mental health crisis and suicide prevention hotline. The Honourable Member for Destiny, Mississippi Churchill River. Mr. Speaker, this government is out of touch with rural Canadians. My constituents in northern Saskatchewan are frustrated with the Made in Ottawa Greener Homes Grant. Because they live a long way from urban centres, the cost of the inspection process nearly equals the grant. Wow. This simply does not make any sense. Unlike the Liberals, my constituents cannot afford to not think about monetary policy and just print money to pay for their bad decisions. Mr. Speaker, is this Liberal government intentionally designing programs that exclude rural Canadians? Good question. Oh, well. The Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, our national housing strategy uh, has a rural lens to it. That is why 38% of the rapid housing initiative projects are in rural and indigenous communities where the need is the greatest. We make sure that in our National Housing Council there are representatives who bring a rural lens to everything that we do through our National Housing Co-Investment Fund and other investments that we make in affordable housing in Canada. The Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Hey, hey. Mr. Speaker, residents of York Simcoe have many concerns about a proposed airdrome in the town of Georgina. In Green Bank, Burlington, Tottenham and elsewhere, corporations have used a loophole in the federal airdrome regulations to exploit municipal soil laws. They use the pretense of building or expanding an aerodrome to dump tons of contaminated fill at significant cost to the environment and to local taxpayers. What has this Liberal government done to close the loophole? And can the Minister of Transportation guarantee this won't happen again in Pefferlaw or anywhere else? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Transport. I can guarantee to you and my honourable colleague that I will always be open to speaking with him and other colleagues about issues that they have of concern in their own communities. I have spoken with the honourable colleague on a couple of occasions on this issue and I committed to him to continue to follow up with him on his concerns and the concerns of the local community. We want to make sure that we build a better Canada for everyone, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Calgary, Skyview. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the people of Calgary Skyview for the honour and privilege of serving as their Member of Parliament after serving as their City Councillor. Throughout the campaign, I heard from many seniors about the struggles they have I'm going to ask the Honourable Member to pause for a moment. I, I, I just want to make sure that we can all hear the question. It's rather difficult to hear the question, but I can get the Honourable Member to start from the top so that we can all hear his question. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the people of Calgary Skyview for the honour and privilege of serving as their Member of Parliament after serving as their City Councillor. Throughout the campaign, I have heard from many seniors about the struggles 
they have endured to the, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Northeast Calgary seniors are community leaders and beloved members of our families. Their health, social, and financial well-being must continue to be a top priority for our Liberal government. Can the new Minister of Seniors tell the seniors I represent about what we're doing to support them in their communities? For seniors. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to first congratulate my new colleague on his election. I think he will make a fantastic representative for his constituents. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to thank him for giving me the opportunity to highlight an important program that benefits seniors across Canada. As the Minister of Seniors, I'm very excited to announce this year's... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt the Honourable Minister. I'm trying to hear her answer, and she's very close, and I still can't make it out. Uh, I know I'm getting older and my hearing is starting to go, but I, I don't think that's the problem today. If I could ask her to start from this top. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to first congratulate the new, my new colleague on his election. I think he will make a fantastic representative for his constituents. Giving me the opportunity to highlight an important program that benefits seniors across Canada. As a Minister of Seniors, I'm very excited to announce this year's New Horizons for Seniors program. Call for proposal is now open. I encourage all members to connect with organizations in their own writings to connect uh, to ser that serve seniors uh, uh, that serve seniors to apply. And I'd, I'd like to thank in advance all organizations for the work they do to support seniors. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, only 6% of people in low-income countries have received the COVID-19 wow. vaccine. The African continent needs hundreds of millions of doses just to get 40% of its people vaccinated, yet deliveries were slashed because of supply shortages, putting us all at risk. Global vaccine production must expand immediately, but Liberals are blocking WTO efforts to get yep. this done. Will this government finally support the TRIPS waiver to help countries produce desperately needed vaccines? Yes or no? Yes. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 pandemic does not uh, recognize borders, will only over overcome through coordinated global action. We have been clear from the start that no one is safe until everyone is. That's why we have committed over $2.6 billion to the global COVID-19 response since 2020. And we have an additional $1 billion for the International Monetary Fund, Mr. Speaker. We will work with our allies and international partners to get this done. Thank you. All right. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, that wasn't an answer. It certainly wasn't the answer we were looking for. The Liberals say they're proud of the actions delivering vaccines locally, but this is the government that pledged 200 million doses for countries in need by the end of next year, and they haven't even delivered 20 percent of that. Yeah, this yeah. is the government that refuses to waive yeah. the vaccine patents to allow poor countries to vaccinate their populations. We will continue to see dangerous COVID-19 variants until everyone is vaccinated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When will the Liberals do their part to end the global health pandemic? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Member, for the question. I look forward to working on this issue and other topics as well. As I stated, the pandemic does not recognize borders. That We will only overcome this with a uh, coordinated global action, Mr. Speaker. We have donated the equivalent of a 200 million COVID-19 vaccine doses, Mr. Speaker. I have discussions with my other COVAX colleagues. We will work with our international partners and our allies to get this done. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. C'est tout le temps que nous avons aujourd'hui.